Thank you, John, for giving us, and all of you, giving us the opportunity to present uh, this model we have developed. Uh, it's um, what we call a multi-objective optimization model for a multi-phase production process. Just as a brief introduction, uh, we are a consultancy company uh, with offices in, in the US and in Switzerland, but our development center is in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So well, I apologize if our English is not as good as it should be uh, because we are from Argentina. Um, well, we have delivered uh, solutions we, we have two areas of expertise in our consultancy company, more than 15 years working. Uh, we have a big area that deals with all SAP business intelligence solutions, and we have integrated them with uh, simulations because we find that they are the best that we can do for our customers. We are specialized in business planning and consolidation, and to do so, well, we have a merger team of different uh, expertise. Uh, we have uh, expertise, uh, uh, some consultants that uh, are, have expertise in finance, in supply chain, while computer science, uh, statistics, and forecasting. And we merge all this to, to deliver the best solutions that we can. So as I mentioned, uh, our goal mostly has been to integrate our planning and consolidation solutions uh, with simulations to give our customers the possibility really to have a tool to simulate and to optimize mostly before taking their this final decision planning, planning in sales, planning, production planning, demand planning, or finance planning, whatever planning they need to do. Uh, some of the models, what as John mentioned, we, we have presented one related to logistics, uh, uh, where we were optimizing the net voyage revenue uh, for inland waterways. Um, we have made a great deal of work uh, in the supply chain area, uh, in production planning optimization. We have worked with uh, building a, a model that allows to analyze the rough cut capacity for an ice cream factory also, well, all related in supply chain, manufacturing and logistic, strategic decisions, uh, evaluating the return of assets. Uh, and well, but I would like to go straight forward into uh, the model that we like. Well, here it's more or less the same as I mentioned that we integrate them with HANA tables, with uh, uh, PP, production planning of uh, SAP, with management, different uh, areas related to SAP. Uh, that's a core of our business. Uh, but I would like to go inside the model that we like to present now. We call it a multi-objective uh, optimization model uh, because it is, uh, it is um, a model that tried to give a detailed scheduling uh, for a manufacturer um, company that wasn't being able to, um, uh, to fulfill their demand. But this uh, production, uh, the production line that you, we were dealing with had different steps. And in these different steps, each of them well, the, 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 the customer would like them, us to optimize them. But really, uh, it wasn't easy, it wasn't, it wasn't feasible to think about running a whole optimization of all the possible combinations uh, that we were going to have. It, was, it wasn't really mathematically feasible to do that because there were hundreds of SKUs and there were hundreds of different combinations. Uh, for each of the steps of the process. So that's why we uh, make an approach towards the solution of this as a multi-objective uh, optimization. Just to introduce a bit the model, uh, we have to go through the type of, uh, of uh, customer of, uh, that we were dealing with. This is a consumer package goods manufacturer uh, that they were producing pet foods 
uh, they had, uh, when you look at the, at the individual capacities of each of the steps of the production line, anybody could say that really they were able to fulfill the demand. They had a lot of capacity, a lot of production capacity in each of these steps. But they were not able to do so, and they really could not understand why. So that's why it was, was one of the reasons of uh, using simulation was really a good thing to do, because we, with a, with a simulator, we could understand which were the bottlenecks uh, and which were the problems that they were having. And then, once we detect them, try to solve them and to optimize what was happening. Uh, in this, uh, this pet food company had uh, an increase in, the, in their demand in the last um, three or four years, uh, a really big increase in the demand, and the profile of the demand was changing. Uh, and this is interesting to mention it to understand much better what will happen afterwards with the model, is because uh, in pet foods, well, people, uh, they used to have large breeds, big dogs, not small ones. Uh, and also the nutrition was very simple. It was a monocomponent formula. In the last past years, uh, people switched their, their taste towards uh, smaller dogs. That means smaller packaging and much more nutritious components. So they wanted to have a food multi-component formula. That means that the manufacturing process of this is much more complicated because you have to extrude and produce different components formula uh, and combine them afterwards to arrive to your final SKU. And that's why I was mentioning that it was not possible to uh, try with a simple optimizer to try all the different possibilities you have. Uh, so, just to resume a bit, which was the problem that the, the customer um, addressed us, uh, they were not able, they were not being able to fulfill their monthly demand. Uh, they needed to improve or at least understand the occupancy of their lines. In the case, they were able to perhaps to close a line for the weekend or whatever to reduce costs. They could not really visualize which were the bottlenecks because, as I mentioned, they felt that they had enough uh, production capacity. Uh, so th it was not really clear why what was happening this, uh, this problem. Uh, they also have a lot of waste during the process, and they had also what they were, what we call the bins where we were st getting stuck. I'm going to explain a bit about that now. Uh, so they needed to really uh, have a detailed schedule of each of their manufacturing steps. Uh, and they also, in some situations, did not have uh, Roma, the raw material that they planned to have. And so the production was planned and built up with that raw material. They have to change really quickly, reschedule their production always in order to fulfill the demand that they were not being able to. So which were the goals of this model? We needed to minimize the production waste. We needed to maximize the plant's occupancy. And we needed mostly to deliver the expected demand. That was the highest goal, deliver the expected demand. And the other two in a hierarchy, they were below that one. Uh, and what was what we really achieved using any logic uh, with an agent-based model? We really achieved a detailed schedule for each of the plant processes, an optimized detailed schedule for each of these steps. We increased the delivered demand um, by a 30% without changing anything in their, in their lines. We reduced the waste they were having in a 90%, uh, they were having a great loss uh, of money with all that amount of waste because due to sanitary reasons, um, when something gets stuck, uh, you have to throw everything away in this, in this industry. So 
the detail scatter should avoid having this, uh, this situation. Uh, and also they had a problem with obstructions in the places where they store the formulas before packing them, what that are called the bins. Uh, and if you store them for a long period of time, or more than 12 hours, they could get stuck. And that would mean also a lot amount of money on stacking them. So I'm going to give a really a quick overview of the process. So afterwards, uh, my team can explain much better how the model works and what we have decided to create uh, a sort of an agent that we call it a bouncer that will uh, uh, lead all the decisions that are being taken in the model to get to arrive to the optimization we were looking for. Uh, the production process is uh, we separate it into three steps: the extrusion, uh, coating, and and drying that due to restrictions, we group them all together. Uh, the bins that have other kind of uh, restrictions as um, limited capacity, limit time of storage, and uh, only one formula could be stored by bin. And then we have the other step, that's the pack line, uh, that it also has a rate, a change over time, and a pack size specific. All these are characteristics of any production line uh, in the supply chain world. Uh, but each of them uh, was meaningful for, for our problem. Why? Because now we are going to start scheduling the complexity. Because as I mentioned, we have switched it into, from monocomponents uh, production that is a straightforward production because you just extrude the formula, you put it into the extruder, you extrude it, then it goes to a bin, and then it goes to, into, a, uh, into the pack lines, and you produce the different sizes of packs, of packs that you need. But now you have to combine different formulas that have to be available at the same time when you need to pack them. And you have to have them available, and also they don't have to be too long in the bins, because if not, we have to throw them away. So then we add in their complexity. And if we extrude just a small amount of what we need, uh, we are going to have a lot of change over times. And also we are going to have to clean the extruders. So that's another addition in the complexity. Uh, so all this has uh, different strategies because if we want to optimize the use of extruders, probably we are not optimizing the use of bins, and we are not going to have what we need at the pack lines in time. So uh, we felt that we have to develop uh, a certain amount of uh, strategies uh, with parameters that allow us to evaluate what was the best option in each of the steps and try to find, to find through the optimizer uh, a trade-off solution that will give the best detail schedule to accomplish the big uh, optimization that was fulfill the demand, that was what our customer was asking for. Um, so here we can mention some of the restrictions we have in the different steps. Uh, the extruder rates, um, have uh, each SKU have a different extruder rate and also have a different change up, uh, change over time, set up time. Um, and also the different extruders have also restrictions according to the raw material, to the formula we were inputting. Uh, the bins, as I mentioned, had restrictions according to the times were, uh, through the time where we could store something in them. And, and the pack lines also had restrictions according to the pack size. It means that not all the pack lines could pack all the pack sizes. So we have to put this all together. So I'm going to give uh, my team the explanation of how they did so. OK. Um, what we did is we used the fluid library from AnyLogic, and we simply there it is. <laughs> and we simply uh, model every extruder, machine, everything we needed, 
uh, as a simple process. It takes an order to process, it, it, it fills a tank, it, uh, it has some bulk conveyor to mimic the delay on the lines and everything. And we come up with like a plant, just like a regular plant that takes the scheduling and just pass it along. So each machine just follows the process, the flow of the production. So what we needed was a, a superior entity, and we called it the bouncer, to decide which, which component, which SKU, which uh, we'll be producing right now. So uh, with an overview of the whole process with every machine, we can predict, calculate uh, availability of the machines and everything. So the schedule takes place at every moment uh, during the simulation. So one can give the, this entity the simplest logic, like, okay, we sort the items in this order and we take them one by one, but in some scenarios this, this order does not work. So we add another layer of decision and we say, okay, for multi-component SKUs we choose them uh, from this way or that other way, just uh, and so on. So we don't have to decide everything right now. Just we set up uh, like layers of decisions to our, our entity. And then what we do is we choose which decisions, which strategies, we call them heuristics, for the, this entity uh, will uh, serve a purpose from, for this scenario, for this configuration. So what we do is just grab the optimizer that AnyLogic gives us and we vary the intensity of each strategy uh, with a common goal. Uh, it could be like limiting, uh, reducing cost in the plant and then the, the optimizer will, uh, will permit those strategies to impact at a higher rate or lower rate, uh, varying those thresholds that we give to the strategies. Uh, so the bias that we, uh, we pose on our strategies is just uh, negligible now because the optimizer will try to figure out which strategies work and which which doesn't. So uh, that that's it for the strategies. And yeah, so I'm gonna pass through some uh, slides about how the model is. So this is the main input scenario. We have the things we can input about the extruders, backlines, and whatever. We have a little like one minute left, so I'm gonna just go through it. Uh, these are the bins, this is the backlines. And well, so, and this is an occupation graph uh, chart. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later. These are the metrics we use in the model. Um, this is an optimizer. We're not gonna run the model because we don't have the time. So what is the data analysis? Uh, we need to analyze the data we have. So during the simulation, we can have the, the occupation graphs, which seem pretty nice. However, uh, we don't know uh, What's, what is really happening at, at, at that time. So let's say this extruder has this, um, a lot of time doing nothing, how, and we have a space in the bin, so why is the, the extruder not extruding? Is this is a problem because the model is not running optimal, or is, something, is, this, is the extruder waiting for uh, another extruder to go along with it to make a, a multiple component formula? So as we see, uh, this um, anal analyzing the data with, with um, with occupation graphs, it gives us a good and easy to read and uh, easy to read and understand. Gives us a good global information, but it's not very specific on what is happening. So, there are some questions this chart alone can answer, like why was this extruder not extruding even if there was beans available? So why is the pipeline number two not doing anything at the first two days, even if there is beans? So, is it a problem we are running suboptimal? Or is it a problem that the pipeline is really not intended to be working at that time? 
So how do we solve this problem? Well, we can go through the simulation again in a slower pace, trying to, un to understand what happened at the time. Or we can do something even worse, I believe, is that going through the Excel output. The Excel output is, is so big. We have finished goods, uh, raw material, we have bins, we have uh, extrusions, we got back lines. Everybody is a shit. It has like 200 lines for each one. So intending to understand, you can do it. I, I mean, if you're proficient in Excel, you, you will understand it right away. Um, you have all the information you need here. However, it's really hard to understand it. You need to know uh, what is happening before the problem you, you analyze in the occupation graph, what is happening now, what is going to happen next. So actually, it's quite daunting going through an Excel output. So what was the solution we gave? Well, we are programmers, and we are quite uh, flexible with Python. And so we, we did a Python analyzer. So actually, we, we did the occupation graphs that, that it had. And it's an interactive tool which has, um, uh, it's very flexible and has these features. I'm, I'm gonna go through the features. So for, at, at first sight, it seems like it's a normal occupation graph, but if we hovered through something like this interval, we can see which uh, master formula, which, uh, which SKU was being packed at which time, what amount uh, of tons was, um, was being packed at that time. So, it's like we solved some of the problems occupation we have had in our model. And we also have this uh, click tool. So when, we, when you click any of these segments, it will show you all the extrusion and bins and pack lines that were involved with this uh, raw material. So it's answering the problems we had ad hoc. You can use another thing. I, I, I believe uh, somebody used Tableau, or I don't, I don't remember. but. It, it used something that was quite similar. So we have all the data available. It's, it's really flexible to do any kind of analysis if you, are, uh, uh, you understand Python is. So uh, what happens is uh, we have this easy to, to manipulate and to, to go through uh, a Python analyzer. And we have this uh, problem uh, Lisa was talking about. The problem was uh, they already did the optimizer run, and they were already using the production, the, the production schedule we, the optimizer gave us, gave them. But the raw material provider had this issue where they couldn't give the, the raw material needed at the time. So what, what is going to happen? We, do we discard all the model? Do we stop the production plan? No, well, with, with Python, we did this. Um, I can't go back, I believe. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. So we made this uh, searcher when you put the raw material here and it gives you an output of all, of all the other raw materials that have the same thing you want. For now, it could be the same uh, extrusion rates, the same packing rates, whatever you need, how many component formulas uh, in between are needed. So it's pretty uh, flexible. It's a, it's, this is not the roof of a Python analyzer. This is only the floor, okay? So, Rounding up, uh, we believe uh, the, the tool we developed was very useful and could solve problems pretty fast. And that's why we went to a Python analyzer. So I believe uh, that's all about the time we have, actually. So any questions or, I'm sorry, we went, I went a little bit fast. Uh, any questions? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there, any questions? Okay, yeah, sure. Hi. I got two questions, basically. So the first one is, do you run uh, optimization, optimizer inside your simulation? And if yes, what, what the optimizer is? No, we actually, the, optimi the simulation only run the bouncer with the, the parameters you, you placed uh, before the run. And then what, you, what we did is run an optimizer over the, the bouncer my Gaston discussed. But we run, but we run the, the opt-quest. Opt-quest, yeah. Opt-quest, yeah. we run it because what, what the difference between running usually opt-quest uh, with an input of the, of the inputting variables is that 
we had too many SKUs and alternatives. So what we really input in that upquest was the range of our strategic parameters to really find the best solution for each of the steps. And with so, this optquest, yeah, thank you. So with this optquest, did you run into any computational performance issues? So how, how, much, how much time did you, did you take it to, to come to some feasible and usable solution? For any feasible uh, solution or good enough solution, yeah. in just two hours you could get two a hours. solution. Get yes, because the heuristics are kind of working. But the optimizer just finds a way. The best one. Yeah, to, to discard heuristics that are bad for that specific case and yeah. to pump up the ones that are good for that case. Really, the, the biggest effort was uh, the development of what we call the bouncer that is an agent that puts all together all the heuristics that we need for each of the step processes. And there is where we really were finding a group of optimization possibilities, and then we optimize that group specifically, so to get the, the, the best one of those ones, because we couldn't try all. Thank that you. was the, the, the approach. Uh, and last and a quick one, uh, is that this uh, Python tool, yeah. is that the pro post-processing of the simulation data? Yeah, we did, uh, we did pre-processing, but it, we didn't have the time to make it into the presentation, but the post-processing was like, you run it and you have it. Yeah, no problem. Anybody else? Uh, great presentation. Uh, I just had one question here. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so in the plant, did you all have any mission breakdowns or unplanned downtime? And, and we, how did you consider that in your model? We don't have. Th this is a weekly schedule. So what we do have is, I don't know where it is. The, oh, here. What do we, what do, we do have is uh, which pipeline can be enabled or uh, which days it will run. So if, if you know that your plan is going to break, you know, it has, has a problem, you can run the optimizer with, I don't know, pipeline one, uh, discard it. If, I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, I, was, I was more interested to know how, how you consider the downtimes. Oh, the, sorry? In the model, how did you, how did you model the downtimes? Of, of a machine don't break Of the extrusions. Of the extrusions? Yeah. yeah uh, if, if I understood correctly, you are, you're asking how did we make the extrusion times be like real? Yes. Okay, so what, what we did is like we had, uh, I believe a hold um, thingy, uh. <laughs> agent. So it, we have like this changeover that waits like for 30 minutes or the, the, the time you put in the input scenario. And then we put a bulk um, conveyor bolts that has a length that is, that will, uh, emulate the time of that process going through the extruder. So we have set up times for the, each machine uh, and down times all uh, on the, like sequentially. And you have the specific rate of each KU uh, that when you input, when the, the bouncer allows the extruder to choose, because each time the extruder is empty, you're, you're asking the, this major agent which one is the best next formula to input to the extruder. Uh, and with that, when you're inputting that SKU, you're bringing into the extruder and also into the other steps all the information you need related to rates, to, to timing of producing, and to the amount you're going to produce. The amount has been pre-calculated according to the demand that you're having, and the, the, the size of that amount can be uh, can be divided in the case you need to to optimize and fulfill the demand. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just, I just had one, one brief question. Um, you said um, I, I definitely see in my models a lot of the times that there's a lot of, there's too many parameters to optimize, and so yeah. I have to come up with a way to yeah. you know do the to, like design the experiment to do that better. So my question is um, one thing I've been experimenting with is within the design of experiments literature, they have something called nearly orthogonal Latin hypercubes. And I'm wondering if you have looked into any of that, um, that literature, that space. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't I, I There's that. something called a nearly orthogonal Latin hypercube. And it's a way of kind of, Latin hypercube, it's a way of like sampling the space in sort of an efficient way, so that instead of having to run like a complete factorial design where you would take the age of the universe to run through all of your 
parameters yeah. you can run through a much smaller set and still get some of the uh, you know the the relationships between parameters. Well, I would I would love to talk to you about that later because we didn't have to <laughs> because we had this um, the the bouncer my um, Gaston talked about was uh, had the set of heuristics we we decided were good because we analyzed the problem so we have like seven or eight parameters we need to we need to change to make heuristics work or not work depending on the case so that's like small space that to to search for yeah, that's about it. We could talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you very much. Thanks.